Hey guys, it's Luke Johnson, CJ Eller, and Jordan Klein. Um, and you are listening to us via the Noetic Humanities app. Go download it for your iPhone and Droid devices. Tonight, um, CJ chose a Zadie Smith article, or, or uh, uh, is that how we would say this? An article? essay. An essay that she wrote for the New York uh, Review of Books entitled Windows on, on Will. Will. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And this is an allusion to uh, the philosophical work of Arthur Schopenhauer. Um, I think what we're going to try to do tonight is to further explicate some of the philosophical viewpoints of Arthur Schopenhauer from a particular work, one that Zadie Smith mentions in this article. Uh, the work is an essay that I was unfamiliar with until Zadie Smith brought it to my attention, and it's called On the Sufferings of the World. Now, my familiarity with Schopenhauer led me to the conclusion that this is largely congruent with his wider authorship. So it's not going to be a dramatic departure from the mm. other things that I know about Schopenhauer. Um, saying that, it is a wonderful read, so wonderful that I felt compelled to make a little audiobook that is also on the Noetic app, and I was able to put together some notes, a synopsis of the text that I will share in a little bit uh, from that audiobook. And I hope you do the same. I hope you you listen and, and take notes along with. That's what the point of this whole app is. Um, so as we get into this, I think first we should do a brief recapitulation of, of the article, of the essay, so people can be familiar with what Zadie Smith is trying to accomplish here. Then I'm going to bring in the Schopenhauer, and then I'm going to ask Jordan and CJ to sort of bring parallels from the essay in alignment with the Schopenhauer text. So, um, what's this? What's this essay about? Who wants to take a stab at it? Sure. So, so let's create the frame for which Schopenhauer is discussed. So, it starts with Zadie Smith recounting going to see a movie with her kids, Polar Express, and forty. The- in 4D. Mm-hmm. And then later... But that's significant, right? That is. Right. Yeah. Well, how is this significant, Luke? Because, because Polar Express 4D is a polygonal motion capture reconstruction, whereas the the representations of the individuals in Polar Express 4D are these computer-generated people that are, like, too perfect. Right. They don't have good eyes. Right. They're, they're, yes, that they're, was... Windows on the wheel, their eyes are uncannily creepy. All right, so she she doesn't feel like she can relate to these representations of people because of their perfection to some degree. Right. Everything else works: their right. hair, their clothes, but the the eyes are problematic for her. And that's where she makes that link to Schopenhauer. And but then later in the same day, she goes on a little date with with a friend, mm-hmm. and they go see Annalisa. Right. Which, and her friend, the Nietzsche scholar. Right? Yes. Right. So, so she can share some of these Schopenhauerian insights that she's gleaned from the earlier cinematic experience of Polar Express 4D and then relate them to the Kaufman movie, Anna Melissa, which she absolutely loves. She's not a big fan of Polar Express <laughs> 4D. But why does she love Anomaly? Tell, we should tell people, I had never heard of this movie. What Me is this mover, movie, Anna Melissa? Right, so it's this movie, like you said, directed by Charlie Kaufman and Duke Johnson, and Charlie Kaufman of, you know... Being John Malkovich, fame, adaptation, yeah. yes. So this movie is entirely done with puppets, which is going to be another Schopenhauerian connection that Zadie is going to make, but it's a movie about this one fellow named Michael who goes to this conference because he is a customer service expert or guru and he's going to give a talk right so he goes to this hotel and the whole event revolves around this hotel and he meets an old flame and then he meets this other girl named lisa who he sort of falls for and that is the frame for which a lot of these of, of a sense of dread and desire not really satiating itself all of these Schopenhauerian ideas and Zadie Smith's going to in this work 
allude to certain ideas, which you're going to highlight, Luke, and which we'll talk about. Yeah. Throughout the story, she gives a sort of play-by-play and comments as we go along. And it would do a disservice for us to highlight every single thing. Mm. But that's the that's the frame of the essay and the frame, at least, of Anomalisa. Yeah, I would add, the only things that I would add, and then I want Jordan to add any uh, relevant details that she thinks are important for our, our conversation, is to foil uh, Anomalisa with... Polar, Polar Express 4D. Mm. Uh, specifically, it's a much lower budget movie. At least it seems like it that way because it's done with these puppets. They're not even properly finished. They have these face masks that aren't uh, fused properly. Mm-hmm. And that'll be something of significance that we'll talk about later in the conversation. But what's so wonderful about these puppets in contradistinction to the representations that are in Polar Express 4D? Jordan, what am I alluding to? Well, the one thing that I sort of like latched on in on was the fact that they didn't have the the seams were uh, pretty much just like exposed. So there was like that sort of like tension between the the artifice and and reality. And right. That's what right. she connected with. But and she said like the eyes were, seem much more, uh, I guess, like empathetic or somewhat more realistic. Right. So she could actually experience like the pathos of a. Of a of a puppet. Right, right. So the they, they yeah. went to great ends mm-hmm. uh, to make the the eyes of the puppets yeah, in on op- like weeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something crazy. They like had that, to get like, like special process. kind of paint right. that had to dry, mm-hmm. so it actually reflected light in a lifelike way. And this is going to be important when we talk about some of Schopenhauer's ideas. And from and she talks about that movie, on Melissa being a, a stroke of genius, and it should have won all sorts of awards. Mm-hmm. Now there are a trillion insights that Zadie Smith makes along the way that we could, that we may or may not talk about. We'll see here. We'll see how, like the general course of this conversation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it's a really wonderful article and front, and just in terms of the festival of ideas that Zadie Smith employs. And from what I can tell, she is really high on this movie. Yeah, a lot uh, of people were. Yeah. It was very critically acclaimed. Yeah. So it looks really, really good. And I love Kaufman. And it looks to be a continuation of some of the other thematic um, motifs that he's done. Like in Being John Malkovich, or being John Malkovich, he's essentially a puppet, right? And then in this movie, it's all puppets, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, Jordan, is there anything else you'd like to add before I do kind of a summation of On the Suffering of the World by Arthur Schopenhauer? No, I mean, we might as well just... Get into it, and then I'll you know sprinkle in any commentary along the way. All right. So Zadie Smith borrows or lifts certain passages from Schopenhauer, from from actually a variety of sources. It's not just going to be from On the Suffering of the World, though there is a passage in this particular essay where she talks about she does have a pocket version, yeah. and this is a short essay. It took me a half hour to read aloud. Uh, some of you could probably read it faster. Um, it, it's not going to consume a ton of your time. And you'll get the general thrust of what Schopenhauer is talking about here. All right. But to make it even easier, I have uh, given us four thematic uh, loci uh, to talk about. And the first is that pain is the rule, pleasure the exception. Okay. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I had I had a few minutes before Jordan and CJ uh, brought me in on this while they were doing the Marcus Aurelius to compose some thoughts. Uh, this is not my most brilliant prose, but here goes, okay? Um, contrary to how other philosophers phrase the matter, evil is positive mm-hmm. in that it makes its existence felt. The good is the negative. Happiness is a desire fulfilled. Get this, though. Pleasure is not so great in that it is ephemeral. Pain is actually greater than and experienced more widely. To show this on our worst days, we can always think of someone who is in a worse situation. Time bears down on us, and if it lets up, we are given over to boredom. Boredom seems to be a result of having our needs met. If men experience success all, successes all the time, they would go mad. Men need adversity to not kill themselves. If everything were perfect, men would afflict disaster upon themselves. Starting wars just for fun, things like that. Schopenhauer says it would be better if the earth were like the moon. (laughs) Non-existence is greater than life. Reason dictates children ought not to come into existence. 
If every feeling of satisfaction is negative, then life is to be measured by freedom from positive evil, where, which no one in particular seems able to win or master. Everyone is subjected to pain and misery on Schopenhauer's view. Yeah, I think it, it's mm-hmm. great to and emphasize the idea of pleasure being this negative thing because I think what Schopenhauer is alluding to is this idea that pleasure is cyclical in the sense that you want something and as soon as you get it, you want something again. And that, and I think Zadie Smith makes a great little nod to that. She says, yeah, well, is it, there? or she says, is it, is it the cycle? Is it trying to find pleasure that's the actual pain? Rather than just pain itself, is that actually something that is in of itself a non pleasure? I think looking for pleasure. Yeah, I think we'll I think we'll discover as we get a little bit deeper into the summation of these themes that man adds unnecessary pain to his life because of certain reflective capacities that he has, and I'll talk about that in a second. Because in the contradistinction of brute and man, mm-hmm. um, what's really interesting in the Zadie Smith article is that you know she talks about this whole like chasing our tail and yeah. then, like we get it we're never satisfied. She makes a nod to the old song that essentially epitomizes the old thing. I actually mm-hmm. went and looked it up. It's a it's it's I'm going to put this in air quote. It's air quotes. It's a Marilyn Monroe song. Mm-hmm. I you know it's it was it's from she, a movie. She does it from a movie. It's actually a great song. Um, I, I put it in air quotes because I don't know who wrote it. I don't mm-hmm. know if she actually sang it. It's sure. it's the mythical songwriter or the <laughs> Foucaultian uh, conception of the center uh, if, to relate back to some of our previous work on Foucault. Um, so it, is there anything else you'd like to say about that before I move on to this comparison between brute and, and man? Sure. I mean, let, let's, let's refer back to the movie Anomalisa where... Our main character, Michael, were he has you know an ex lover, and we get this history that he was with her and he was happy, and then all of a sudden he just breaks things off. And in the movie, they meet up again, and, and Zadie Smith emphasizes the fact that he doesn't know why he broke up with her and he's not and he doesn't really feel interest to get back together with her right there's this urge to go see her this urge to call her up and say hey you know it's been years but then the conversation's awkward and he loses that desire to meet up with her so in the sense that like the the song goes you know you want something and you try to go for it and then it just turns out to be once you get it it's not as great as mm-hmm. it's meant to be. And I, I mean, does that not describe, I don't know, our modern world any any better? I mean, goodness. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I'm starting to experience that. I've never really yeah. experienced it before. Starting to. I mean, I have. Yeah. But. I mean, it even, even in the movie, and Zadie Smith refers to this idea that there's all of these certain things that come up in Michael's life and I think just in all of our lives with all these advertisements and certain pleasures that are at your fingertips you know yeah it's like the the fleetingness of desires you know I mean especially with like the ex-girlfriend Bella and and Lisa he he just gets like sort of like inflamed with this passion but it just it fizzles out as soon as it as like quickly as it flares up and what's the what's the representation of that in the movie like how does that how do like so not only not only does he say that that happens or can't really give an accounting of himself but what happens to the individuals in the movie as soon as he can't experience express why he no longer is attached to them or wants them it's a very simple trick i think Jordan. yeah no it's great with like the the voice acting yeah what's well, tell people to, what happens yeah i mean it just goes back to um pretty much I think they're like what only three voice actors in the entire cast, and so um, of course I'm I'm blanking on them right now. But I think Jeffrey Jason Lee, yeah, and um, the it's British annoying. dude, yeah. Uh, Jeffrey Jason Lee was the only one that uh, I, I recognized. Yeah, so oh, basically, uh, yeah. Um, it's pretty much Lisa is like the only distinct voice, and then the is she the entire guy. time. Is she then? No. No, she's no. not. Because she's just... Oh, the, se- the second he has sex like with her... It's like that epiphany, right. The second he has sex with her and gets what he wants, she starts to she sound like him. The same voice. And mm-hmm. everyone in the world, and this is a larger 
conversation we're going to have in this in this conversation, everyone in the world, what's the main character's name? Michael. 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 Mm-hmm. Sort of looks like him and sounds like him with the exception mm-hmm. of Lisa when he first meets her. Right. And then like once he gets what he wants and they have their little puppet fun, <laughs> right? She begins to start to sound like him and he starts to despair because he knows that he's going to not care for her anymore. He right. really only wanted to express something, which we'll talk about, right. which is this Schopenhauer and will to live, right? Okay. So they're very, so Michael's living in this very weird world where everyone sounds and looks like him to a certain degree. Um, sorry if I'm spoiling it for people, but I don't think the movie's about big reveals. I think it's about a human experience. Right. So I don't think I can give it away too much. Sure. So I think, I think we've outlined this idea of pleasure, which is a very modern thing that once, I think Schopenhauer says, once we have our, our needs met, we want to complicate it even further. And instead, I think like in the movie, instead of just having f- regular food or salmon, it's got to be this special cooked salmon with bib lettuce salad in this really complicated order. Yeah. Let, let, let me uh, talk a little bit about that. Go yeah, ahead. Yeah, because yeah, I think that fits. It's a nice segue. So, so the next theme that I had this conversation organized around was that it was, on Schopenhauer's view, better to be a brute. All right, mm-hmm. and a brute is a non-human animal. All right, okay. So animals have it better. Men, just like animals, pursue pleasure or avoid pain by seeking out health, food, etc. However, men experience the passions for these things so much more intensely. What's going on here? It is man's ability to reflect on the future and past. He expands and complicates the nature of his desires and fears. Animals can only exist in the moment. Whenever an animal suffers, it suffers for the first time. When the animal receives a pleasure, it experiences it without great expectancy fulfilled. He enjoys it for what it is. Man's reflection and accompanying emotions exaggerate all pleasure and pain by pressurizing his needs. He needs luxury, spirit liquors, and whatever else. Alaskan, specific Alaskan salmon, as you alluded to, as Michael's in the hotel room. It constantly occupies him, in part because he's obsessed with how others view him. This is a psychological phenomenon brutes are unfamiliar with. Dogs don't go around comparing themselves with one another. Or maybe they do. Maybe, some, <laughs> maybe there would be some uh, 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 so, dog sociologists that would say that there's some sort of hierarchy or something like that. So one of the things that happens in the movie, right, is that there is this sating of needs. Michael's in a hotel room a great deal of the time and experiences a boredom, a certain sort of emptiness, so much so that he almost peels off his face, right? Mm-hmm. So what is boredom? Why don't brutes have it? It seems attached to our intellectual pleasures and our ability to disproportionately satisfy our basic needs. People that pursue money and do not feed their minds pursue amusements everywhere and are usually dissatisfied. Death is also really real for man and causes him great distress. Brutes don't really comprehend death. Brutes also don't hope either. They don't know fantasy and imagination like us. That's one of the joys, and I put that in air quotes, we have, but we almost always experience a letdown, just as Michael does with Lisa. Mm -hmm. The brute is just an embodiment of present impulse. They do have a tranquility of mind in the joy of the present moment. An animal's pleasure and pain are never accompanied by dizzying or frightening expectation. Mm-hmm. Schopenhauer feels sympathy towards brutes, animals, and hates how men tie them up. They need to be free. Okay. Mm. All right. I've said a lot there. Yeah. Why don't, why don't we expand upon that? Sure. I mean, uh, let, let's quote Zadie Smith, too, in this as, as well, because she quotes Schopenhauer, like you said, that we have these base needs, like the brute, but on that narrow edifice, she's going to say, and I'll quote her, she says, Yet on this narrow strip we build the extraordinary edifice of pleasure and pain, of hope and disappointment. That idea that we, since we have, since we fluctuate between want and boredom, hope and disappointment, we create potential, more potential pleasures, but also, and more importantly, and even more emphatically, pain more pain yeah. with that right as well. right like so what would be what would be an example of this i mean right like think about i mean think we're caught up in sort of like a, a modern capitalist society something that mm-hmm. like everyone can can relate to right it's not enough for us to just have like a means of going from like a to b right 
like we have to have a car that looks and goes a certain way or whatever and like when it fails or if something or if the new model comes out or something like that and mm-hmm. we get embarrassed as we compare ourselves to other people there's this dramatic mm-hmm. letdown right. right so we amplify all these pleasures we can take like fine like enjoyment of like the mm-hmm. shininess of of a of a Rolls Royce or something like that mm-hmm. right but like there's great sadness and loss like if something were to happen to that Rolls Royce if it were to right. mm-hmm. suddenly disappear or get a scratch on it like it would really right. affect get, us yeah, we get psychologically like, we get like attached to these things yes mm-hmm. and that's a big problem for Schopenhauer yeah. right because mm-hmm. what's what's he ultimately trying to what I mean what's what's he trying to say right is like that, what's that, prob- yeah what's problematic when we become sort of like slaves to our desires right what, right we, and we just kind of like puppets we just kind of get Hold along with them. I mean, even Marcus Aurelius says that in meditations that, you know, if you don't do a good job of reining them in, you just kind of get dragged along by your own impulses, basically. Yeah, they have a control over mm-hmm. you, right? Now, he doesn't go on in this particular essay to give a full-on endorsement of asceticism, but right. given his fascination with certain Eastern philosophies, and I think this, I, I, don't quote me on this, but I think... Because Schopenhauer is more sympathetic to asceticism, that's going to cause yeah. a rift between him and Nietzsche, mm-hmm. right? Hence why Zadie Smith will uh, talks about how her Nietzschean scholar friend uh, will indulge a Schopenhauer conversation because there is this intellectual divide, right? You know, um, asceticism is not going to be an option for for Nietzsche, mm-hmm. right? Um, okay, cool. Um, anything else about like how this particular like brute thing comes into i thought this was really lovely this part of the the schopenhauer essay um i love the idea that he talks about how like animals are so wonderful because Mm -hmm. they remind us of the present moment whereas like like right now as we're like performing this conversation like we're having a conversation but there's also like five million conversations going on in our head at the same Mm -hmm. time whereas like an animal is just Boom, dialed yeah. into the moment. Well, it's funny. It was uh, like to to that point. There's a, a video that I saw the other day and it was of like, a seal, a uh, zoo. And in his little enclosure, he had like this little like ramp. And all he did was he would just walk up the ramp and he would slide down. And he did it about, I don't know, three or four times. And I was completely entranced with this clip because I thought, Here's the seal. He has found the key to happiness. And he just kept doing it. It was just like this wonderful simplicity of watching the seal, finding great entertainment and joy, just like sliding down his ramp. And that's probably why like people love animals so much in general. Or like why on like social media people are constantly sharing animal videos and, and I'm that person. That, mm-hmm. Yeah, and I love it when yeah. you do that. I mean I think it's the coolest thing ever. I I love them too, you know. Um what about this whole idea that it's preferable to be a brute? If you guys had the choice, mm-hmm. would you be a, a brute over a person? I mean, do you do? Because a big part of like, like apparently the brute doesn't think about death, right? Like the brute doesn't because he does a, a brute can't fantasize about having a Rolls Royce. They can't have that expectation dashed, mm-hmm. right? Also, because the brute isn't. Um, amplifying whatever pain it receives it just kind of receives it as it is there's not and you've talked about this in marcus aurelius right you've talked about how Mm -hmm. how much the mind affects like there's this bifurcation between the pain in itself and the pain we believe it has right right Mm -hmm. um i don't know i mean what what do you find that convincing of schopenhauer at all I think it's a cool idea yeah i mean i think that just since on sort of the heels of meditations I would say that that notion of living sort of like in the present moment and just like living sort of sort of like moment to moment, that's something that would appeal to me. But then not having that sort of like dizzying excitement or that sort of anxiety too, I don't know. I feel like that'd almost be like a cop out <laughs> if I just kind of w- would be able to live without that, you know? You'd rather take the the dizzying hop. <coughs> The dizzying highs yeah. then have like kind of a more level trajectory. 
yeah uh, i don't know that's the thing is that the level trajectory seems like the most admirable but then there's also something sort of like exciting about that that anxiety and that's sort of the, the dizzying you know heights of like possibility you have an animal on your yeah <laughs> that's awesome. i do <laughs> that's awesome uh what about this notion what i thought was also sort of interesting schopenhauer says that it would have been better if the earth was like the moon mm. right that desolate yeah if like like if the earth were just this whistling of wind and there were no luke voice and there was no static of the internet that's that's also being recorded along with this or the passing car (laughs) um what do you think about this idea that not only is it better to be a brute than a human it's better if there was just nothing at all well, yeah, because if you have nothing, then you can't... If, if we didn't exist as human beings, we wouldn't have this fluctuation between want and boredom that Schopenhauer and Zadie Smith alludes to, right? Mm-hmm. We wouldn't have that at all. It'd just be easy. I mean, because there'd be nothing, right? So that almost seems like not a cop-out, but it's almost just like, man, why didn't we, why didn't just, why didn't we just not exist at all? Right. Yeah, it's totally mm-hmm. framed in terms of pain terms, right? Like yeah. an empty universe would be better than intelligent life in it. Mhm. Because Maybe. of all the baggage that but, intelligent life right. brings. Right. But this is from a, like a, like a almost a godlike perspective, right? Like mm-hmm. Schopenhauer's like because then I could get out of it and right. then it would be in this sort of like perfect scenario. That like so I guess what he's trying mm-hmm. yeah. to say here and this alludes to some of the connections between Buddhism and Schopenhauer. Mm-hmm is that what he's trying to say is a perfect God would never have made man. Mm -hmm. mm. Would never have made sentient beings. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about it, but he talks about it. That's why he has an affinity for Eastern religions because in Hinduism, I believe, or Brahmanism or whatever, the the creation myth is something to the effect of an accident of of an accident that Brahma Mm -hmm. like makes a mistake and that he has to like work his way out of it like painting himself into a corner and be like freak like how do I get out of this corner Mm -hmm. and that's just by and and that existence is just penance for that mistake yeah yeah Mm -hmm. yeah yeah that like and so asceticism and self denial starts to become a real option does this idea of brute and nothingness does it does it get worked out in uh, in Zadie Smith's article more or uh, Anomalisa anymore? I, I think it, it does in an, in an odd way because we're talking about the idea of desire and, and that's brought up time and time again where even the hotel room is an embodiment of this human condition where things, you, you have a past expectation and then maybe a future hope and that these ideas can be dashed I mean, there's this funny example Zadie Smith alludes to when Michael is in the shower and it fluctuates between really cold and really hot and all he can see is like, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. And and then the shower, you know, it gets, you know, to a, a, a normal temperature or a comfortable temperature and he's fine. And I think it even talks about how he's having a conversation with Bella and Zadie Smith alludes to the idea that he says, you know, oh, it's boring. The room is boring. Even even when Bella is complimenting him, like, oh, nice room. He's yeah. like, it's boring. Yeah. It's boring. It's boring. And that this is the human condition. And if it were Schopenhauer, you know, mm-hmm. why don't we just get rid of it all? Yeah. Yeah. And I'd like to quote um, Smith on the hotel rooms because I, I just thought it was uh, entertaining and true. Uh, If hotel rooms exist to anticipate desire, to meet and fulfill all our needs, why do we often feel despair in them? Is the fulfillment of the desire itself the despair? A lot of people kill themselves in hotel rooms. Yeah. That was kind of a weird thing to bring up, but that's true. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe there's something to that with this connection. Yeah. They're probably going to do it anyway, anyway, probably somewhere else. But yeah, like you said, like whenever I go to a hotel room... uh, yeah, you have everything met for you. So what do you do? You just like yeah. veg out and watch TV and like get stimulated. Yeah, but mm-hmm. but I think it, it's important to even emphasize that last sentence from Sadie Smith, which says, "Is the fulfillment of the desire itself the despair?" Where in the con- human condition, even if we talk about the highest of highs, mm-hmm. built within that is the lowest of lows. Right. So you can never escape the low ever. 
which is the Schopenhauerian idea, where it's just like, if we can't escape it, then why have it in the first place? Which and is you, that negation yeah. that he refers to. Unless you turn to the side and reach into the drawer and pick out that book that the Gideons put there. All right, let's go to uh, why does torment pain exist? Okay. Um, so why does all this torment and pain exist? Yeah. All right, all right, all right. All right. So we've been dancing around it. Uh, the will to live, which underlies all phenomena, feeds on itself i.e. the animals eating one another, okay? To get even more metaphysical and borrow an Eastern theodicy, Schopenhauer mentions Brahma producing this world by mistake and has to work himself out of it. We've already talked about that. Schopenhauer likes this view. Perhaps this is where an interest in asceticism comes from. Schopenhauer can't get into the Christian view. The preponderance of evil and the imperfection of man is just too much. Man would be better to not be. As it stands, we come into a world of grievous suffering and misery, is regarded as a penal colony, which I thought was a really interesting analogy. Schopenhauer says, this idea is present in Brahmanism and Buddhism. You will regulate your life correctly if you embrace this view. Each of us pays the penalty of existence by suffering. This view of life allows us to contemplate the great imperfections of man and treat him better. Okay. So the whole idea is the fact that we exist and the fact that we suffer is to be understood as like the price we pay for existing, mm -hmm. right? Like we're just prisoners and we've done something wrong by coming into existence. And so we have this light sentence that we have. So we mm -hmm. have to mm -hmm. go to, we have to lift weights. We have to, uh, uh, I don't know, um, to pick up cigarettes. basketball <laughs> games, like, yeah, play cards, uh, I don't know what else they've got in prisons. You know what I'm saying? Um, mm -hmm. So what about what about this idea? What about this idea about the will? And and I mean specifically, it relates to the title of the Zadie Smith thing. Was this the windows on the will and the eyes and the eyes and the face plates? Right. Let's talk about this. Right. Mm -hmm. So and and the and the uniformity of the puppets. Right. Mm -hmm. The puppets themselves. Okay. This is a movie about puppets, Anna Melissa. Right. The fact that everybody's on. Sh you know, being walked around by strings or in nearly invisible yeah. strings or whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, what what's this? What is that telling us? Or what is right. being John Malkovich tell tell us? Sure. What's going on there? I mean, the puppeteer is the will. We yeah. are all part mm -hmm. of that. We that's that's what brings us all together. Yeah. Is that yeah. we are all the will and we are all representations of the will. And it's fascinating. Zadie Smith alludes to the idea that in the movie, one of the climaxes is when. Michael and Lisa are in a dream, Michael's dream, and they're both being tormented by everyone else in the world who are, as we alluded to earlier, all seem to be the same person or seem to be Michael. And and Zadie Smith alludes to this moment being almost a Schopenhauerian optimistic moment where Michael sees himself in Lisa now, she says it's not a full Schopenhauerian view because if it were, then he would see himself, Lisa, and everyone else as one person or as the will, right? But doesn't he come to understand that? Or does he just miss out on it? I think he misses yeah, he out misses on it. it. Yeah. yeah, but I think that's this idea of the will is supposed to be one where we all are, I think, for Schopenhauer is something where we all become realize, realize we all come to realize that we are all the will right and then in realizing that we can be more compassionate to each other yeah. and more aware of the universe we live in i mean it's almost the, the first tenet of buddhism right the world the world is suffering suffering is brought on by attachment yeah. and attachment is this idea that we're all ourselves or we're all individuals and that's mm -hmm. where the big problem begins yeah and i'll just say i had a little bit on compassion it's like two sentences yeah you know, just to say when okay. we see faults appear in others we are comprehending our own faults yeah since we are all sufferers or individual phenomenal instantiations of the will mm -hmm. schopenhauer wants us to see our united lot and therefore be more sympathetic more compassionate to all even the deplorables Right, so even people that we consider like kind of the rejects of society, the basket of deplorables, the basket of deplorables, <laughs> right? We are them. We are all, like we yeah. we need to be able to see 
that everything that they have, we have too, right? right? We are all this will striving mm -hmm. in this phenomenological, or this phenomenal, I should say, um, we're a realm of phenomenon. Um, and we've all got these different errors and idiosyncrasies that manifest themselves right. in different ways. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, I don't know if Michael Hatt gets to the compassionate point of view. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it, he, I think he gets to the understanding that we're all interconnected because I think he starts to realize people are all sounding like him. Mm -hmm. He gets this, Michael gets this, uh, this sex doll, this like mm -hmm. hyper, like this suit quasi futuristic Japanese sex doll. I, I don't want to get too graphic about it, but it's got some of his DNA. I don't, I don't it. think it's his. No, yeah, or, or I, I can't remember. Yeah, it sounds like it's yeah. his. But uh, anyway, yeah. he re sees it as a symbol of the will, or Zadie sees it as a symbol of the will. Right. But is Michael ever truly compassionate? He goes and gives this talk right. because he, he is talks a about it. yeah, he's a celebrity in the customer mm -hmm. service. Thing. And he says, you've got to recognize the beautiful individuality of every person and, and everyone wants to be loved and everyone has a childhood and everybody's got something that they're all trying to overcome. Validate but, people. But yeah. he, does, he fa does, he, does he fail to do that? Yeah, in his there's not like a disconnect. There's like a disconnect. It's like, a, you know, it's like not entirely like joined together. It's kind of like disjointed. It's like, oh, just. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, <laughs> and that's what Zadie Smith even realizes was just kind of ironic and funny. When, and she, I'll quote her, she says, she says what we might find bleakly funny in all of this is that Schopenhauer's proposed and partial remedy to this situation, compassion, mm. sounds not very different from Michael's customer service bromides. Right. So it's it's interesting that Schopenhauer says, okay, well, the only the only thing we have to really do is, I think, as he as he says in that one essay, you know, is address people as fellow sufferers, right? Yeah. Is that it? We just you know be better to each other and. That makes the world better. I mean, it does sound. I mean, that is a a noble pursuit, and, and people have done good in the world by doing that. But it almost seems as if Zadie Smith finds it sort of like she says it's bleakly funny in the sense that it's very similar to customer service reunions. Like, remember to smile, you know. Everyone, everyone's someone, you know, someone to love out there. You know, you just gotta. Remember, every person you need, you know, or everyone you meet, you know, needs love. So you got to speak love, you know, to everybody. You know, it's just like, it almost just seems like these bromides that you would find in customer service. Well, if you really worked it out, if you took yeah. that really seriously. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I guess the question is, why yeah. ought you to be compassionate mm -hmm. on Schopenhauer's view? Well, it's I mean, the world is suffering. Right. And let's say Jordan's going through something particularly bad. Yeah. Okay. Just because I know that the world is suffering, and I think this is kind of going to be Nietzsche's point to some degree, right? Mm -hmm. Like, why ought I to make the, why ought I to sacrifice any part of me to make your life better? Now, Nietzsche, I'm not doing Nietzsche justice here because he, there's there's an opportunity for Nietzsche to be kind to others, mm -hmm. um, but we're not, we don't have Nietzsche's text on hand here right now. But in general, like. If the world is full of so much suffering, and I can be momentarily compassionate towards you to yeah, help you out not, in your lot, like in the grand scales of everything, what difference does it make for me to be compassionate to you? Mm -hmm. If I can make your load just a little bit lighter, mm -hmm. like what does that really yeah. accomplish? I think that's what Zadie Smith alludes to. I think even at the end of the essay, she just says mm -hmm. like compassion is just as is about as good as it's going to get, right? Where it's like just doing good mm -hmm. for somebody like. That's going to be as good as it's going to get in a Schopenhauerian view, right? Yeah. And I think that's – which leads to further inquiry in that. Like what's the point? If that's as, as good as it's going to get, I think I might want to go back to the moon, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and that's why – I mean Schopenhauer says that much, right? So I guess the question is and, – and Schopenhauer does have an essay on this, but like – On he, what? On, on, on suicide. I mean, we should look at it, um, but you know, if he really does think that non-existence is better than being a brute, and being a brute is better than being a person, I this compassion solution. Does, I I mean, I would it would seem like his his own writings would lead him towards 
an advocacy of suicide in some way, mm-hmm. or at least asceticism, at least asceticism. Right, and which is which is fascinating too because he sees art, or at least I mean, Zadie Smith alludes to the fact that he sees art as a way to quote unquote offers itself up the art object offers itself up to us as an object of aesthetic comp- contemplation by means of which we might be able for a moment to willlessly contemplate the will yeah. so in a sense that I maybe mean, we can go on living if we have these of art and you know music writing poetry etc to in some sense escape our own little prison cells are which are could be our thought that we are just individuals you know suffering like my lot is my lot and nobody else knows how i feel mm-hmm. if we can escape that and realize that we are all one thing then maybe that in some way might make yeah, life worth yeah, living yeah 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 i think we i think we have to do exp- have to explore the arts um I think Schopenhauer would agree in some extent. I mean, oh yeah, I think he would too. I mean, Schopenhauer, um, Schopenhauer was a big music fan. He he played the flute. Not a lot of people know that. He he one of, one of the few. You gotta get your kick somewhere. Yeah, he he enjoyed walking his poodles, and he played the flute. Yeah, it's pretty pretty cool. All right, so I think we did a pretty good talk. I think we popularized Zadie Smith. I think we popularized Anna Melissa. And I think we popularized Schopenhauer. We did a pretty good job. Yeah, and I think it'll lead to further explorations. You know, maybe maybe these other discussions of these essays of Schopenhauer. You know, even of Zadie yeah. Smith will be on the app already. But I think it's fascinating how certain essays or certain readings can provoke you to look up further things. And I think this essay is a wonderful introduction Mm -hmm. to Schopenhauer through the lens of a movie. And not only a movie, any movie, but a movie that contemplates our very modern existence, right? Of a 21st century life, which has Mm -hmm. these luxuries, be it of a hotel room or of, you know, men, women, you know, love interests, it just explains. I mean, Schopenhauer explains the modern condition in a very unique way, and Zadie, and for Zadie Smith to find that connection and then to extrapolate on that, I think it's very useful. What I and think, very yeah. awesome. And what I think is really cool about Schopenhauer, he's one of those philosophers that, like, once you read him, like you start seeing him everywhere. Right. Yeah, I don't know about you guys, but like once I read. On, on the sufferings of the world, like I was like, oh, like all those things that weren't making sense now are making sense, right. and mm-hmm. and I find that with certain thinkers, I think Freud does that for me, um, uh, Nietzsche will do that for me, Kierkegaard obviously does that for me, mm-hmm. but there's it's it's weird the, those pe- these types of philosophers where you put on the rose spectacle speckled uh, rose spectacles and then everything appears rosy, right? right. So um, he's, a, he's an interesting thinker. Yeah. Um, I have a lot of questions about it, right? Like, yeah, I, I do too. I, I, I question his yeah. relationship with religion. I question um, whether or not it truly is worse to be a, a human than non-existence or brute because we do have these intellectual powers. Like, like what we're doing right now, mm-hmm. I love this. Like, this is cool and sustainable to some extent. Philosophy seems to be pretty freaking rad. Um you know, and there's other stuff. I, you know, there was interesting in this, in the, we'll have to maybe do something more dedicated to on the sufferings of the world. He talks about, um, that there is something Christian about, about his message, um, specifically in relates to the fall and the error that was made there. And just if, if Schopenhauer really is as anti-Christian as people think he is. And then I have to ask myself, is he as pessimistic as people say that he is? A lot of people say that this is like the master of gloom and doom, but I don't know. If I if I scrutinize it a little bit more, there might be something really life affirming about Schopenhauer. Yeah. yeah, I think he's just kind of master of like the real talk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm. yeah. No, I mean I remember it was W. H. Auden who wrote this great little essay on Franz Kafka, and at the end he 
makes known, he says, that one has to read Kafka when they are cheerful and eupeptic, mm. right? That you have to be of a certain good good humor already to read Kafka to actually understand what he means. Because we think of Kafka as well as a gloom and doom sort of writer, but he says there's something more to it if you have a certain life-affirming attitude when you look at his work. So maybe it's the same with Schopenhauer, because I'll admit... Right. I read it, and I almost got a sense of life-affirming nature, too, as, as well as sadness. Because it makes but, you feel like you're part of something larger than yourself. Right, sense, right? and that With compassion yeah, and that compassion is, is the way to go, and that we all, and empathy is the way to go, that we all, like you said, are a part of this greater thing. Mm -hmm. So maybe we have to approach Schopenhauer or these thinkers and writers and artists that have quote-unquote negative view, perhaps... Mm -hmm. In a, I don't want to say cheerful, like, let's go to Schopenhauer land, yay! But with a sense of... <laughs> <laughs> That's the most depressing amusement park I've ever seen. And, I, and part of me wants to make that amount of money we so we can that. build that. That would be <laughs> amazing. <laughs> no, but... <laughs> what would it be? It would be like a broken down tire <laughs> swing. I don't know yeah. what it would be. It would be like a burning tire swing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then the soundtrack would just be a single flute play like, yeah, really yeah, horribly, yeah, yeah. like... <laughs> <laughs> like a scratch record of, a, of one song. Yeah, <laughs> but no, but if we if we look at it in a cheerful way instead of... Because I feel like maybe if we are sad and we read Schopenhauer, we just get worse and we're just like, oh, everything's terrible. But if we look at it kind of like, huh, what is he really meaning? And what is he really... There's something about being cheerful or of a, I don't know, of a sober mind... That when you look at something, that you can see it differently, I suppose? Yeah. I think that there's sort of that, that sobering aspect, but I think it's kind of like a little bit like Marcus Aurelius, kind of mm. in the same sense as Schopenhauer, of like, yeah. they're just kind of like, well, you know, bad things happen, things suck, and it's pretty miserable, but I think that the solutions are something that you have some sort of agency in, mm -hmm. so I think that there's some sort of solace in the fact that you can practice compassion. It's not it's not something as like fluky potentially as like grace, you know, or yeah. something like predestination yeah. like, oh, I don't know, I might be saved. Yeah. Well, you'll you'll yeah. be happy to note though that he does Arthur Schopenhauer does refer to a lot of Greek thinkers in on the mm -hmm. suffering of the world. He's you know, mm -hmm. he mentions Cicero, mentions Plato as mm -hmm. these people that looked Claudius. Claudius. He looked uh, that looked onto the world as you know, quote unquote, suffering or just you know, it's miserable. Yeah. So I mean, it's kind of like the Schopenhauer kind of gives us like the bitter pill, but he also has like the antidote. Yeah. So what were you gonna say, Lucas? Yeah. I just uh, just to, to to piggyback on what mm -hmm. Jordan said earlier about the compassion thing. I think the the compassion thing represents a bit of a paradox to me because yeah. because I think like I was using my example of being compassionate to you if you were ever going through a rough lot. Mm -hmm that would show attachment to you, right? Mm -hmm. And care for you as a person, right? right? And and in a way, you, when you suffer, I, my even though I'm being compassionate, mm -hmm. like my, my suffering goes up when I'm connected right. to you. So in some yeah. ways, I'm actually amplifying my pain right. by caring right. for you. Because one could find yeah. pleasure in helping people. Yeah, it's And then that spike. pleasure, it goes back to the cycle of like, I need to help more people. Well, and then you're just yeah. in that yeah. cycle. So I guess my question would be, how in the sort of Schopenhauer sense, how do you filter pain and pleasure? And how, is there a way that you can kind of sort of divorce yourself from... I don't think you can. I don't think you can. You're just, yeah, you're just on the just will. I don't know, what is it? You're on the wheel. Yeah, wheel of Ixion or what yeah, was that? What was the, yeah, the Greek is a Greek mythology. Do you know what that is? Uh, gosh, I don't remember. Yeah, yeah, I think it's I-X-I-O-N. We'll have to look it up. Yeah, I think it, I think it was just some person of Greek mythology who was whose punishment was to be... Yeah. On a wheel, or we could just allude to Sisyphus, where it's just like Constance you push the boulder, up. yeah, you push the boulder up, and you're like, "Yay, I helped!" You know, like for you, it's like I helped out Jordan, yeah. and then it falls back down. You're like, "Oh crap!" There's more people to help, yeah. or like, "What about me?" And then you run back down. And you're like, "I helped myself." Oh wait, there are more people to help. Okay, and yeah. then you just exhaust. It's yourself. a never-ending cycle. I, yeah, I don't think he thinks that. So long as we're humans, I think yeah. death, death is really the only way that we. Escape and maybe it. the only thing you can do is yeah. just put a magnifying glass on. This suffering. Oh, the only thing you can do is maybe like with what art does, or maybe what Schopenhauer sees art doing, is examining this wheel in all the different angles that you can. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And that if we can oh. get ourselves out of just imagining ourselves on the wheel and sort of also see oh, everybody, you know, see uh, maybe a bigger picture, a bigger scope, and see other people that are on the wheel and maybe ourselves as well. Everyone then, else, like, rolling their rock up the hill. Yeah, then maybe we can have, I don't know, maybe... Maybe just maybe it's just more of a knowledge of the will rather than happiness, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Which is like knowing that you like. I guess again, it's like the Buddhist you know idea that like you need to know like the world is suffering and suffering is caused by attachment. And if you can detach yourself, then that's that's the end game. But that doesn't mean you're not going to still suffer. Yeah. <laughs> well, we should probably bring it to a close there. Sure. All right. Well, Great. fantastic, guys. I really enjoyed this essay. I really I enjoyed too. doing Schopenhauer, and I really appreciated your guys' conversation. Yeah. I think you really excellently contributed to it. So, uh, yeah, we'll get this uh, up on the Noetic app ASAP. Excellent. All right. Cool. Thanks, Zadie Smith. Oh. Thanks, Zadie Smith. You're the best. Bye.